Welcome to CFTC Talks. I'm your host, Andy Bush, Chief Market Intelligence Officer for the CFTC. Hey, as always, there's a disclaimer at the end of the show that's important for you to listen to. So this week, we've got part two of our conversation with University of Chicago's Will Kong. Last week, we discussed his papers on blockchain disruption and uh, some of the interesting insights that he had on decentralized consensus and a lot of other cool stuff. This week, we're going to dive into his travels. Uh, Will went to 10 different conferences uh, across the globe uh, on blockchain and fintech and technology. I really hope you find it interesting. I know I did. So please enjoy the second part, part two of our conversation with Will Kahn. Will, let, let's switch gears a bit and talk about your recent travels. Over the last three months, you have been to many conferences across the globe, and I think you've been to like 10 over the last three months. So you're, you're certifiably a worldwide crazy traveler. But you went to the European, uh, two of them that were really stood out to me, the European Summer Symposium in Financial Markets, or the ESSFM in Switzerland, and the Asset Management Association of China Workshop, uh, seminar at Ant Financial, which is Alibaba. But l- l- let's start with the European Summer Symposium uh, conference. What did you hear and learn there? Uh, sure. Um, yeah. As you said, I, I travel quite a bit, and uh, I'm just glad to get my uh, United 1K status <laughs> uh, on that. Uh, so the uh, the European uh, Summer Symposium in Financial Markets is uh, – it's it's based in Gersense in Switzerland, um, and uh, actually at the study center of Gersense, which is a foundation of Swiss National Bank. So ah, that's uh, that's okay. a place where you know the annual summer two week program brings together researchers for seminars, focus sessions, or uh, evening less formal evening seminars, and, and also a lot of collaborative research. Um, people come from all over the world. Uh, they're working on uh, various topics, uh, bank regulation, uh, security issuance, asset pricing, so on and so forth. Um, what um, what I so so I actually presented my work, uh, some of my papers on blockchain there, and uh, it's just great to see how uh, academics uh, react to these topics and uh, what kind of additional questions they they are curious uh, about mm-hmm. and uh, and that's great conversation and feedback for for the research itself well in in that questions and and uh, that they had so I'll ask you about the questions about mm-hmm. your paper D- did mm-hmm. any of those questions surprise you a little bit or take you to a, a, a different place that you thought you were gonna go um, yeah so I was pleasantly surprised that more people are paying attention and uh, they are more kind of receptive of these uh, research topics because because these are really new. There there isn't a, a framework or foundation or established theory in it. Mm-hmm. So it, it's wide open, but uh, it's also challenging in the sense that uh, number one, many people had a prior that okay, uh, fintech or blockchain that's just hype, right? So there's no new economics to it. And uh, another challenge is some people are genuinely interested in it, but it, it, ta- it takes time to introduce the background and, and educate the audience first before uh, it, it can become a conversation where they also raise interesting questions. Now, in this conference, uh, or symposia, uh, what's great is, uh, is that many faculty members are already reading into this line of research they follow what's going on in the industry, and uh, a number of faculty members from, uh, you know, LSE, MIT, Cornell, Berkeley, HBS, NYU, they are all uh, working or starting to work on it. So I think that's a positive development in in the field, both for academic research and and for the industry. Uh, I mean, it's possible that there there may or may not be interesting economics there, but without studying it, uh, we wouldn't know. And we might miss out a uh, very interesting uh, academic research as well as uh, uh, development in the in the industry because of that. So I'm, I'm glad to be uh, to be there to to interact with people who are interested, 
in the topic and also to kind of personally contribute to this development. Well, what I what I reading your research and and having just had on uh, uh, Yale's uh, Robert Schiller, uh, obviously mm-hmm. very involved in behavioral economics uh, along with Richard Thaler. To me, there's there's a wonderful behavioral economics component to the studying of blockchain and incentives mm-hmm. and and collusion and things like that. So to me. I, I think there's so many different areas uh, in economics that you can get into uh, and, and study with this. It's, it's going to be fascinating. This is going to be studied, I think, for a very long period of time. So I'm honored to have on somebody who's groundbreaking in the research. You know, and I think it's always, it's always difficult when you're doing new things to get people to understand right. not only what you're doing, but also the value of it. So I, I know that's very challenging. W- was there anything else at that conference that was, that was interesting that stood out to you? Um, yeah, I mean, I mean, you're absolutely right. It's, uh, it opens a new arena for traditional uh, research um, topics such as behavioral finance or behavioral economics. Overall, uh, what I, again, was uh, pleasantly surprised is that it's not only about blockchain. It's a general shift in attention to fintech, mm-hmm. uh, alternative data, uh, you know, crowdfunding, um, which uh, you know, academics were really lag, uh, lagging behind for the development of internet. Right, we start to see <laughs> research on that after 20 years of development. Uh, so I think this round, hopefully, you know, economists and researchers can be a more uh, uh, active contributor to the whole development. Yeah, that makes sense. Well, let's switch to the other side of the world because that's where you went. Let's talk about mm-hmm. the Asset Management Association of China workshop. Tell me, like, what were the different mindsets between obviously being in Europe and, and having a lot of people from uh, Western Europe and obviously the United States there as well, but talk about the differences in just the way – that uh, the Far East views uh, what you're doing and, and maybe, uh, like, did they take a different approach to how uh, they receive the information from you? Uh, sure. Um, so, so that was a, a fun uh, workshop uh, jointly organized by the association and also Data Yes, which is a leading fintech firm in China. Um, so, so the association is basically kind of self-regulatory organization that represents mutual fund industry in China, uh, but it also covers like uh, insurance uh, companies, trusts, uh, QF2s, private equity firms, and so forth. So uh, what's, what's different in China versus uh, uh, other developed countries or so economies is that the financial system uh, has been lagging behind. For example, credit reference system in China is, uh, is very minimal. Uh, people were not using credit cards much, right? People were using cash and all that. But uh, both the industry and also the government do recognize uh, it's an opportunity to kind of utilize the development in fintech area to uh, 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 leapfrog, uh, uh, what do you call it, uh, the, 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 to, to, to overtake um, certain other systems Mm-hmm. In the sense that the cost to adopt to new technologies um, is lower and it's easier because the established system is not um, as Efficient, as right? uh, firm, a, yeah, right? right? Yeah, <laughs> yeah. So, so in that sense, um, they're very open, and there's a lot of applications of fintech in in uh, investment industry. Uh, over there, I, I pretty much talk about uh, quantum mental investment, which is a, kind of a course I developed uh, at the uh, University of Chicago, combining quantitative and fundamental approach with an emphasis of applying fintech and uh, uh, you know, machine learning, uh, big data analytics to, to investment uh, uh, problems. And uh, 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 you know, one, one topic I touch on, which is also joint collaboration with Professor Tong Yuan Leong at, uh, at University of Chicago is on uh, textual data na- uh, analysis, uh, where whether it's to predict outcomes or draw statistical inferences, um, we, we want to do it in a way that allows us to process large 
quantities of text, uh, but at the same time preserve their complex information and language structures, uh, and also making sure it's computationally efficient and economically interpretable. Uh, you know, uh, so, so I think people are generally interested in how we use these new techniques to, say, predict IPO underpricing from IPO prospectus or uh, using news to detect market sentiments and, and figure out how uh, macroeconomic announcements such as uh, you know what's going on in FOMC in the U.S. is transmitted to uh, financial markets. Um, so, so overall, I, I do feel the practitioners are very open and uh, and uh, are very active in applying some of these. You know what I love about what you just said is is and I and I'm going to reference uh, Bob Schiller again, but you know he when I had him on, we talked about. Uh, his paper and forthcoming book on uh, the economic narrative, right? So you're talking about language and the ability to understand text. And what Bob was talking about is that the uh, the narrative that's in the marketplace is driving a lot of the values that are there. And how does that narrative develop? So when you talk about IPO underpricing and what's in the market, how people are looking at it, how people are viewing it, the language that they use to express what the IPO is, how the market you know expresses back in language or text, their feelings on it are all part of this. And I think it's wonderful because it, it, it really is such an unexplored area of economics that I think has tremendous value. Uh, we here at the CFTC, we, we've developed um, an entire team that's somewhat dedicated to economic narrative or market narrative on, on uh, market dynamics, liquidity, and fragmentation structure and those kind of things. So we spend time really trying to understand what people are talking about and, and discussing. So I think you are on to something really neat there. And I, I'll have to go and take a look at your your um, your class to see what you go through. I, I, we'll have to talk about that another time, but that sounds really interesting. Let me let me come back to the mm. seminar or the the yeah. um, the, the conference that you attended. W give me your three top takeaways. Uh, you know, when you when you were there, like what are the things that just really stood out to you uh, from the participants? Um, sure. Um, you know, I, I'm glad to hear. You know. Uh, People at uh, CFTC are also working on, on these topics, and, and there's an interesting link. Uh, overall, I think practitioners are just very open. There's, there's great demand for understanding fintech developments, uh, be it how to value blockchain-based startups or trading cryptocurrencies or using tax to develop trading strategies. It's that uh, possibility to uh, leapfrog the existing development uh, that uh, prompt people to uh, pay a lot of attention. That, that was the word I was looking for, leapfrog. Leapfrog. Uh, <laughs> yes. Um, so that's number one observation. Sure. Uh, number two, uh, I think the industry tends to be bolder and uh, they experiment more. Uh, some experiments will lead to great insights. Some leads to uh, frauds or <laughs> rediscoveries of existing economic theories. Uh, I mean, there's always uncertainty, but I think it's good to, to experiment and learn. So in that sense, it's important for academic researchers, uh, myself included, to, to interact with them, to keep a sanity check, to make sure our research is relevant, yeah. uh, not just uh, you know, in the ivory tower cooking up things, imaginary building, building castles in the air kind of uh, uh, research. Um, and um, they also have um, uh, great uh, resources and data for research. So there's room for uh, collaboration. Now, having said that, uh, I think the participants also lack a general framework to think about many of the fragmented insights they have. Um, so in that sense, uh, I think practitioners can also tap into uh, research academics for a organizing framework and, uh, and to better understand the development of the technology and, and to, for example, design uh, token supply in their, in their startup or uh, having a more in-depth understanding 
of the black box uh, machine learning algorithms that they, they just take from uh, a, a library, <laughs> a, a specific <laughs> software tool, without, uh, without understanding what exactly they are capturing. Um, I, I think there's a lot of synergy. Uh, yeah, I, I agree. You know, it's uh, I had Nick Cook on the show from the FCA, and one of the things they were focused on is is you brought up you know the uh, the black box or the algorithms that people are using. If they're just pulling stuff off the shelf, y- you can get yourself in a lot of trouble uh, doing that absolutely with, without understanding what it actually does. Um, and in and it may engage like if you're a bank, and I think Nick brought up on the show how it could lead to. A return to something we we're very familiar with here in Chicago from the 50s, which is redlining in um, in, in certain housing districts, uh, which uh, actually caused right. a great deal of problem. And you can have the same kind of problem in banking where you're not lending to certain groups because your algorithm is telling you not to. And in reality, that that is actually <laughs> committing some problems uh, and, and breaking regulations and breaking rules. So I think that's a great point. All right, let me let me wrap this up. Let me ask you one last question. Um, taking a step back from from all the conferences that that you attended over the summer, what did the combination of these tell you about blockchain? Like, kind of give us a big picture overview of of your takeaway from the the ten different uh, conferences that you went to. Mm-hmm. Uh, sure, it's a uh, it's a promising area of research. Uh, in my opinion, mm-hmm. there are many unanswered questions. Um, even to pose the questions is challenging, right? What What are the key issues? Uh, not to mention answering them in a satisfactory manner. Um, and it, it's not only about uh, benefits or advocating the technology. It, it's about the various trade-offs, uh, potential costs and detriments uh, that would be useful for regulators and for society uh, in general. Uh, you know, I, I was also at uh, Ant Financial Services Group, that's the uh, formerly known as Alipay, which is an affiliated company of Alibaba Group. Um, they, uh, they are uh, very active in terms of producing uh, a large quantity of data and carrying out uh, research. So, so in that sense, I also feel um, this is an area where Practitioners and academics can really come together, uh, you know, interdisciplinary knowledge and uh, cross-group synergy would be really beneficial for the whole development. Uh, most of the conferences I've been to are academic conferences, uh, but fortunately there are also a few industry-oriented uh, conferences uh, where there's also great research and great data um, so in that sense, uh, I, I would uh, hope to see more uh, people you know, conducting research and, uh, and uh, answering important questions in this area. All right, that's a wrap for this week. Uh, as we wrap up part two of our conversation with University of Chicago professor Will Kong, uh, we'll be back next week with more interesting guests on our quest to learn about the markets we watch. I'm Andy Bush, Chief Market Intelligence Officer for the CFTC. Thanks for listening. This has been CFTC Talks. But wait, we're not done yet. It's time for a disclaimer. The CFTC is providing this information as a public service, and it is neither a legal interpretation nor a statement of CFTC policy. Reference to any specific product, service, trademark, manufacturer, or service provider does not constitute an endorsement or recommendation by the CFTC. The CFTC is not liable to any consumer or any third party for any direct, indirect, incidental, consequential, special, or exemplary damages or lost profit related to the use of the information provided or referenced in this podcast. Selection of guests on the podcast does not imply an endorsement of any particular individual or entity. Many individuals and entities provide similar services to those of the guests. The views and opinions expressed by the guests in the podcast are their own and not specifically endorsed by the CFTC. Moreover, the information provided in this podcast should not be construed as investment advice. Consumers should rely on their own inquiries as to accuracy and relevance of the information incorporated or referenced in this podcast and assume the entire risk related to its use. 
and the CFTC is providing its interpretation of market trends solely to inform the public of a framework for projecting possible outcomes under different scenarios. If you have any questions concerning the meaning or application of a particular law or rule administered by the CFTC, please consult an attorney.